It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today I wanted to talk about all of the open source things that I've been telling you about for the last couple of years, at least the ones that I still use on a day to day basis. And I wanted to talk about not just that I use them because I mean, of course, yeah, I use a lot of the stuff that I tell you about, but really how I use it and why I use it. So I wanted to go through that. Maybe it'll give you some ideas, some inspiration. Maybe you can reply back on the comments in the video and let me know how you're using them and what you're doing with them and how you've made the best out of some open source software. I'm really interested to hear that. I always love to hear your stories and hear the things that you guys are doing with it out there. So definitely let me know that as well. Before we get started, I just want to say thank you to all of my subscribers over at Patreon. I truly appreciate your support and I appreciate so much that you enjoy my content and that you want to support me and continue to make this content if you haven't subscribed yet and you'd like to, jump over to patreon.com and join in and just become a subscriber. I'll have a link in the description and in the show notes so that you can do that. Thank you so very much. I truly do appreciate it. Before we finish this up, I also want to say if you haven't clicked on that thumbs up, go ahead and click on that. It lets YouTube know that you like the video and other people ought to see this video as well. And it really helps me as far as the channel analytics go. So I appreciate that also. So the first thing that I use still today is Dashi. I really, really like this dashboard. I've shown you guys a lot of stuff. I've got some things coming about how to kind of get these little graphs out of your servers. So this is one of my servers that I run. And then here's another one. And it keeps saying it's not refreshing, but it is. So, um, yeah, I don't know why it does that on that one. But there, I mean, this is what it looks like. You just hit the refresh button. You get some good information right out of your servers. And you can kind of see the, the real quick basics of what your servers are doing, which I think is awesome. And then when I'm not looking at it, I can just minimize it and it gets out of the way but this lets me have all of my information up about all of my self hosted or hosted out on the VPS cloud stuff you know you can really put any links here you could put Google here if you want to but for me it's a great way to quickly get to my self hosted software and I, I really appreciate how much work the developer has put into Dashi um, she's really really awesome she does some incredible stuff and she just keeps adding and adding and adding and it just keeps getting better so if you haven't tried it out definitely go try out Dashi it's a great way to keep track of everything you're running and have a quick glance at what's going on. So all these things, the little green dot means that right now it appears to be up, that everything's working. If it has a red dot, either it's not up or it just isn't pingable. And I haven't changed that yet. Um, so this one's got a green dot. This one's got a red dot. I don't know why. So I do have two different open sprinklers and I'll talk about those in a minute. But yeah, I mean, I love this because it gives me just a really quick glance at everything that I'm running. And there's lots of different ways you can run Dashy. I just run it as a dashboard and then it opens up things in, in new tabs, basically. But seriously, such a such a great tool and, and just something that I don't think I could do without. A lot of people say, why don't you just use bookmarks? Well, bookmarks are great, but bookmarks don't tell me, is it up right now? Is it working? Does it appear to be online? Because when I look at this and I see a bunch of red, I know something has gone wrong. And that tells me I need to start troubleshooting. And that's a little bit about what I want this video to be about. So a lot of these things just run on my internal network, and I know which ones are running on my internal network. And if I see a bunch of red dots on things that are running on my internal network, I know that either my Docker instance isn't reachable. So wherever these are running, something has gone wrong with just that, that machine, and I'll go check and see, can I ping that machine? And ping is your friend. If you don't know how to do a ping, it doesn't matter if you're in Windows, it doesn't matter if you're in Linux, it doesn't matter if you're in Mac OS. You bring up a terminal, and I'll make this a little bigger for the folks on the mobile devices. You type in ping, and then you type in the IP address of the machine you want to see if it's up and running. And assuming you haven't disabled the stuff that allows ping to work, it'll come back and it'll tell you, I reached it, and here's how long it took to turn, you know, to turn around. So it's less than a millisecond right now. This is on my local network, so of course it's pretty fast. And when I'm finished, I just do control C to stop it from doing a ping. On Windows, it'll do four pings and then it'll stop on its own. And if you want it to continue, you can run a few different uh, uh, commands to make it do that in Windows. It's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I mean, ping is super, super useful tool. So don't, don't forget about the simplest tools can give you some really basic information. So if I do a ping, I know my system, at least the server is reachable on the network. So that tells me one thing. So now if I see a bunch of red, I have to ask myself, okay, why wouldn't these be working? So my next tool is what we'll talk about here, Portainer. It's just a tremendous graphical user interface tool for doing anything with Docker. And you can host multiple instances of Portainer. So you need one of them to be the actual Portainer install. And then you install the rest on your other servers as Portainer agent, and you connect those servers to the, to the main server. And once you've connected one, you can't connect it to a second Portainer. So you need to make sure you wanted to do this, but 
if you want to connect it to another one, you have to disconnect it from this one and then connect it to another one, or you get an error if you try to connect them both. So um, there's some security kind of based around how that happens and everything too, which I really appreciate. But then I log into one place and I've got a bunch of access to all of my Docker servers and Docker containers. But I can go here and see, like, do I see something wrong with my containers? Like this one says stopped. Well, that's because it's Watchtower. I have it stopped on purpose right now. But if I came in and I saw a bunch of other ones stopped and I was like, oh, okay, I see why they're not working. Then at least that gives me an idea. I can just check the box and I can say, you know, start this container and it's going to start it up and we'll see if it gets going. If it doesn't, then I'll see what else is going on. You start looking at the error logs, but you can also just check the logs of your containers to see if you see anything weird happening in the logs. If they're running, but you can't reach them. A lot of times just looking into the logs can tell you something has gone wrong. Sometimes the fix is just like they always say in the IT world, did you try turning it off and back on again? So you can just click here and click on restart. And a lot of times that will also fix whatever problem you're having. Sometimes a container just has an application that hits an error and it doesn't know how to recover. And you just restarting the container is basically like rebooting the computer, turning it off and back on again, and things are fixed and ready to go. So a pertainer is a terrific tool. And I use this probably at least almost every day, if not every single day. So when we go back and look, then I can get these things back to where they should be, which is green, which is what I want. And most of the time they are green. I don't have to worry about it. But lately, you know, I've been messing with my network, so I create my own problems a lot of times more than anything. So the next things that I use on a very regular basis are Proxmox. So I have two different Proxmox servers, and somebody asked me the other day, why haven't you clustered those servers? Well, I, I did it on purpose because I'm trying to learn, and I use one for learning, and then I use one for like, okay, I'm going to go set that up correctly. Uh, based on what I just did here and if I mess this one up it's not anything running production so I can I can manage to go and fix that problem so with, with Proxmox if you're not familiar with Proxmox uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what it is it is a virtualization server that can run virtual machines or virtual containers that are extremely lightweight so in this case I'm running our port which is another tool I'll talk about in a minute on a virtual container and you can see here what I've allocated to it. And the nice thing is, is this is allocated. This is not actively being like used. And you, so if you create a VM and you say, I'm going to give you 16 gigs of RAM, the host OS says, okay, that 16 gigs is gone. It's reserved for that virtual machine in a lot of cases. With containers, you say, I'm going to give you up to so many gigs of RAM. And if the container needs that many gigs, it will use it, but it doesn't get reserved by the host OS. It's really just kind of there in case you need it and it'll take what it needs as it needs it. And you can see here, it's barely using anything. There's no CPU usage going on. There's no RAM usage happening really, but you can see where I get little spikes of activity depending on what I'm doing. So pretty great for, for containers and, and LXC containers that uh, kind of act. They're just like a super lightweight version of an operating system running on a host machine. And then you've got your regular VMs. So this is really a management system for your VMs with a nice graphical user interface where you can go in and start a VM, create a VM, stop a VM, remove a VM, do, you know, whatever you need to do with those virtual machines, you can do that. Um, and, and it's really, Proxmox is just a, an amazing tool for doing those things as well. You can take backups and keep backups of everything. So I use Proxmox pretty much every day to, to manage my infrastructure here at my home. I've got a couple of servers um, that I run. So I had a server I saved up last year and I bought a server on eBay. It's an R, uh, R730XD, I believe is the name. It's by Dell. And it I, I meant to get one that would hold 3.5 inch drives and I ended up getting one that held like 26 2.5 inch drives, laptop drives, which I was not looking to getting, but it works good. So I'm using it and I've, I've set up some 3.5 inch big 8 terabyte drives in a, in a, in a, in an enclosure that lets me have ZFS and, and a lot of storage, which is great. So it works really well as long as I remember to restart the enclosure and make sure it's running before I start the VM or the host anyways. Um, the other ones that I got, I was very fortunate at one of the viewers um, contacted me and said, Hey, I've got a couple of old servers. Would you like to have them for, for practicing with? And, uh, I just was blown away by that offer. And he, he was close enough to me that we could both drive a couple of hours and, and meet. And, and, uh, yeah, I was able to, to get a couple of servers that I'm also using for some really great stuff. So, um, I'll kind of move to the next thing, which is true NAS. I use true NAS, um, as my NAS system. So I do use TrueNAS, and you can see I'm barely using anything of the capabilities that it's got. It's got 32 gigs of RAM. It's got quite a few CPUs here um, that are, you know, it's multi-threaded CPUs. 
but I use it for exactly what you would expect somebody to use TrueNAS for, which is a backup server. And I back up my Proxmox server to it, and I back up a lot of my Docker stuff to it uh, individually, and I back up uh, some of my my machines here in the house to it so i run basically an nfs share and i use that to to mount on those machines and create backups of my media and everything else so that i've got it there and i don't have to you know i don't have to worry as much about having some kind of catastrophic thing where i lose it now that's two different machines but they are here in the same location which is not the best idea for backups you should really do a three two one backup which is three copies on at least two different physical devices in at least two different physical locations um so that's that's the important part that that I'm not doing today, but I plan to get set up in the future and we'll have some open source software that will let us do that as well. So don't sweat that. So that's how I use TrueNAS and, and that's kind of how I how I get those to interact from Proxmox to TrueNAS is through an NFS share and then Proxmox runs its backups normally on a schedule and it's just straight over to the TrueNAS, which is really great because I've got the Proxmox version, I've got the backup version, which is awesome. So that's kind of my server setup. You know, I've got two two servers running Proxmox and one running TrueNAS, and really that's kind of how I function with, with the systems here at my home. Um, the other one that I've been using for a long time is a laptop that I kind of use as my reverse proxy coming into the house. Uh, and uh, it's been working great, but lately it's been acting up a little bit. It probably needs to reinstall. Um, but, you know, for three and a half years, it's been doing a tremendous job, so I can't really complain because it's been doing really, really well. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, it's time for me to move that over. So I'm in the middle of migrating that that, that reverse proxy over to uh, my my server here, so that it kind of runs as its own little uh, containerized application. And I'll continue using it just like I have been. I just need to get it migrated and make sure everything works correctly. And I want to make sure that I do that right. So it's a it's a process for me to take on a little at a time as I have time. So the next thing that I use and that I want to talk about is just my network because I've talked about that a lot lately. And I use right now, this says, <laughs> this is the image for um, OpenWRT, but it's not OpenWRT. This is actually um, running my, my dashboard, and, and I've already got it open somewhere else for OpenSense. Um, but I use OpenSense as my firewall and my, my router. So OpenSense is the routing portion of my network, and you can see it's got a nice dashboard. But I can really do all of the things that I want to do, and I can see what's going on with my systems here. I can kind of keep track of all this stuff. It's got plugins that you can add on if you want to. I really just kind of use it bare bones out of the box for the most part. I did add WireGuard as a plugin, but I haven't set that up yet. Uh, but I can see my information about my systems, my WAN, my LAN, everything like that, which is really, really great. I like the way that this is laid out. PFSense is also a tremendous tool. These tools have almost identical capabilities. Um, PFSense may have a little bit more just because it's a, it's a for sale type product, even though it's open source. Uh, but uh, Open OpenSense has really worked well for me, and for me to get it set up felt a little bit easier and more intuitive. Uh, just the way that the flow is, is laid out, that's it. Um, really, if you want to run PFSense, go for it because I think they're almost identical as far as how the as far as all the things they can do. Uh, but OpenSense just for me has been working much better, so I've been using it, and I really like it. Um, so OpenSense is kind of the first part of my network. Uh, that really runs my router and everything. And then after OpenSense, uh, I've got basically some DDWRT. Um, they are routers, but I'm just running them like access points. They don't do any routing. They don't do any DHCP. They're really just access points around my home. And they are wired. Um, so each one has uh, Ethernet running to it. Uh, one has Mocha running to it. But there are, there are four wired access points. And then they provide the wireless signal for all my wireless devices around the house, smart smart device, everything like that. And somebody pointed out recently, oh, I see why your network seems slow sometimes with Eero. Um, it's because you have a ridiculous number of wireless devices. Yes, I do have a really ridiculous number of wireless devices. I'm trying to move everything to wired that I can just because it's so much more stable um, and, and reliable and it gets those things off the wireless network, which is great. But also I do need to create VLANs and start using that. I'm, I'm learning about that. I'm very new to VLANs. I just haven't done it in the past, but as I learn about it, I'll teach you guys about it. But if you want to know about VLANs today, I'll tell you where I'm going to go to learn about it. It's over to Scottabyte because he has some tremendous, tremendous information about VLANs, um, just about the concepts, about how it works, about why it works that way. I think it's going to be a really great place for me to go and, and just rewatch those videos and really absorb that information. And if you're interested in VLANs and, and understanding how to break your network apart and separate some of that traffic so that it's not having so much information overload on your network, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, definitely go check out Scottabyte and, and his channel and all of his information. He's got tons and tons of great stuff out there. 
So on my network, also I run Pi-hole. You can see here I don't have a lot going on right now, but um, yeah, I mean, it. it I, I run just, I've, I've got two actual Pi-hole machines that I run because I want redundancy. So if one goes down, the other one takes over, and then I've even got a couple of other, I've got some, some outside DNS just in case both of those go down so I don't lose completely my ability to get to the internet until I can fix that stuff. But I'm trying to run it with some redundancy there, so I've got two things of Pi-hole. And then I've got Pi-alert also kind of watching my network to let me know about any devices that jump on suddenly that I wasn't expecting or looking for. And uh, refining that, I've been going through everything to, to get that done as well. So that's, that's kind of where I sit with my network stuff, um, R port. So this is the kind of the next thing I want to talk about, which is um, R port and Mesh Central are really remote machine management systems, and they are just super, super tremendous tools. They do things in a slightly different way. So I'll talk about Mesh Central first, actually. Mesh Central, if you haven't seen it before and you're like, you know, I need a way to get a hold of my machines when I'm out remote. I have a video out there that shows you how to set up Mesh Central in Docker and then how to basically create a reverse proxy to get back to your Mesh Central install and how to set all that stuff up. Um, now, if you're behind a double NAT, there may be some extra work happening. I am not behind a double NAT. I am just behind a single NAT. So I'm able to get out to the network or to the internet, but I'm able to have my own basically IP, uh, which is this, this thing. And I've got two-factor authentication set up on it. And I can run these machines and basically you go install an agent on any machine that you want to have connected to Mesh Central and that agent just runs in the background but it connects up to Mesh Central and you can see which ones are connected to which ones aren't right now and then you can go out here and actually connect these machines you can and if you click on one you can see here um, I can jump to the terminal and I can connect and I can do what I need to on this machine and you can see I get exactly what you would expect um, terminal access now if you have a desktop that you want to connect to you can do that as well so if I come back over, I have this desktop, which is the one that I'm working on right now. So it'd be kind of weird to connect to it. But you see, I get this desktop tab. I can click on desktop and you can see it gets the matrix effect, which is kind of weird. Um, so I need to say disconnect from that. But you can jump over and connect your desktops as well. Now, if they're not connecting, if they're not checking in, that could be because there's something wrong with your internet connection. The system is asleep or hibernating. The system is turned off. Lots of reasons why they may look like this. So just be aware that this does happen um, and you may have to fix these kind of issues over time uh, you may have to look into why it's not connecting there could be something else going on but if they are connecting then probably things are working okay as far as mesh central goes you just need to check on that particular system itself and in that case you may need physical access or have somebody who can get physical access or have a different way to get physical access to see what's going on um, so that's mesh central I mean super tremendous tool it's got so much capability and power if you're looking for a remote management system where you need multiple users to have different permissions to access different machines and you have a whole bunch of people you're supporting, I think Mesh Central is a ter terrific tool because right through the web browser you can get desktop access, terminal access, console access, just so many great things. If you haven't checked out my video on that, you might go do it uh, for sure if you're interested. R port is another remote machine management tool. Um, so I can click here on, on my machine here on the server. And again, I've got this set up to go through a, a home network, uh, but, but basically from the internet. So from anywhere, if I can access rport.org and I can access my Bitwarden and get my two-factor authentication and all those kind of things, um, I can access this system and I can see what's going on on my server here. So it gives me some stuff. It lets me know if there's updates that are needed on these servers so I can check out my different servers and what they're running. Um, and But the nice thing is I can create a tunnel. So from here, I can create a tunnel, and that's going to basically, from this, I say create a tunnel, and I want to do a, an SSH session. It'll create that tunnel for me, but it tells the server to say create a tunnel back to me. So the, the machine creates a tunnel back to my R port server instead of me having to punch a hole in the firewall. So it comes out without punching a hole in the firewall on the, on the client side. And it says, okay, here's your tunnel. And then I can connect up using something like Remina on Linux to do either the SSH session or a desktop session for RDP or a desktop session for VNC. It doesn't really matter how you set it up, but those tunnels let you do that. So it's a really awesome tool. And I do use this for doing some, some very easy management because it's really great. So I've got two different ways of accessing some of these systems, which makes it super terrific to have both of these really amazing open source tools that I can put to work when I need to and I can really do things very simply and I've got kind of redundancy here if I need one way or the other to access systems um, so yeah definitely check those out R port and mesh central are amazing tools I got videos on both of them 
Um, next is Pry Tunnel, so I want to talk about VPNs a little bit. So this is the easiest, and it's an open source VPN that you can set up in the cloud, and I have this one running in the cloud. And basically this runs an open VPN service for me, but it also runs a WireGuard service for me. So I can actually just download their client onto any desktop that I want, and I can connect through, through WireGuard or through OpenVPN and access other machines that are connected to this network or just get out to the internet, and I've got a nice private connection to the internet. So when I'm on public Wi-Fi, uh, my family has had to be in the hospital over the last year a few times, unfortunately, for different things. And when I'm there, I'm trying to take care of them. Uh, hospitals are great and they have you know Wi-Fi access for you which is awesome but I, I prefer to have a VPN so I immediately go to, to my open VPN client on my phone or my device or our pride tunnel VPN client on my laptop and I turn it on and I connect securely that way so I can't say enough amazing things about something like pride tunnel and I have a video out there on pride tunnel as well this thing just runs I really rarely have to mess with it other than to get out there and just update the server occasionally reboot it if it needs it um, you can add multiple users. They can each have their own profiles and download their own profiles and use those to connect through the Pry Tunnel client again from the desktops. They have it for Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you need to access the system through a phone or a tablet, the OpenVPN client will absolutely utilize what they've got for the for the for the uh, credentials uh, for OpenVPN. Now for WireGuard, I don't think they have mobile support yet. But for, for OpenVPN, a lot of times that's all you need to have a good VPN connection back and get some work done and do some things you need to do through a VPN, which is really secure and really safe, which I really, really love. So if you're trying to, to get something set up really easily, I highly recommend checking out Pry Tunnel. It's a really great way to get a VPN set up really quickly, and it's got some really great functionality. Again, I've got a video out there on it from a while back, but it's, it's exactly the same setup. I went through this a while ago uh, with, another, with another person to help them set it up, and it was the same exact process. My next one is Home Assistant. So this is kind of my dashboard, my main dashboard for, for Home Assistant. You can see here I've got a, a couple of my cameras coming through that I, that I have set up on another system as well. Um, but I can see the, the temperature and set the temperature for my home. My family is cold natured, so they like it very warm. Uh, I am not in that part of the house right now. I'm out of my own office where I keep it much cooler. But this is how they like it, so I let them have it like that until I go in in the evening. And then I'll turn this down before I go so that it, or actually I have it scheduled to turn down before I go so that it's a little bit warmer when I get to the house. But here I've got a view of what the, the current weather's like. I can check out whether the lights are on or off, coffee pot turned off like it's supposed to, things like that. And then everybody's phones and, and what they have as far as battery power and uh, some really great information here just on the main dashboard. Uh, there goes my mother-in-law working in the background there um, in the yard. But yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a tremendous, tremendous tool. Um, here I've got set up scenes for my room, basically my master bedroom, where I've got different areas in the room. It's a pretty large room um, and I can set the lighting to different levels the way that I want to and kind of track what's going on there. Um, my wife sells on eBay and she needs different lighting levels for when she's doing photos for all the things she's selling. So I've got this tab set up for her that she can jump onto and quickly set the lighting and everything like that. Um, this is for our decorations out front. I can turn it on and off pretty easily um, whenever we've got decorations going. Um, this is my wife's office, so I can see like what's the temperature again cold natured. They like it very warm uh, You know whether the train room lights are on or off for my dad's train room uh, a few different things like that so and then here I've got all uh, my three of my cameras that I can view and kind of get a look at here just through Home Assistant. I don't have to go open up the different camera application if I don't want to, but I can just kind of see quickly what's going on from Home Assistant, which is pretty great. And then I've got a testing tab where I test a few things before I put it on one of my main tabs. And then I've got a different system. Now this one, my Zigbee uh, temperature sensor is offline, but uh, something I can fix. But I can see my outside temp. I can see my, my temp here in my office, which is getting a little warm, so that should kick in again here in a minute. But you can see what's going on with the temperatures. I can see my lighting, everything like that in my office when I need to and, and kind of keep that uh, under control as well. So Home Assistant is a tremendous tool. I've got a series of videos out there on Home Assistant if you're interested in running Home Assistant. It is one of the most amazing open source programs out there, I think, that I've ever seen because the tremendous amount of work that has gone into making something that is really very complicated, which is getting a bunch of disparate home automation systems to work together and to work well and to function properly is just unbelievable and I just cannot believe how well this really does and how easy it really is and how amazing the documentation is and how amazing the community is around it um, 
you see a lot of folks who who like the Alexa system or the Google system or the Apple system those are all great but I like things to be under my control again this is about open source if, if you're looking for an open source way I highly highly recommend that you check out home assistant dig into it learn about it figure it out understand it it's just so great it really just to get it up and running takes almost no time if you've got a raspberry pi and an sd card you can get this thing up and running in no time if you want to run it as a virtual machine you can do that if you want to run it on docker you can do that if you want to run it on odroid you can do that out on the home assistant website they've got two dozen different ways that you can run home assistant and really take over the home automation of your house and and really I use this for a great dashboard. I don't use much of these clickable buttons. I have a lot of things just automated that I don't have to mess with it. And that's the great thing about home automation is that you're automating things. So home assistant is definitely one that I love and, and a constant daily use, honestly. Uh, I showed this one a while back. This is called the uh, Agent DVR by iSpy. So if you don't know iSpy, they were a Windows only system for a long time for, for doing IP camera stuff. Um, and I just really, really love the software that they've created here that is open source and it's called Agent DVR. And as you can see, you can set up multiple cameras and they've got multiple views and they've got recording and I can see the recordings and I can set the recordings to be based on motion and I can set motion zones for those recordings. I can just, there's so much that you can do with this thing. This is a super powerful, amazing IP camera surveillance system. And I just absolutely love this thing. It does such a great job. And really, once it's up and running, it just runs. I have set this up for myself. I have set this up for a client who also uses it for their business. And it is a tremendous tool. It is just absolutely incredible. And, and I love using it. It just makes it so great. Um, I have a video out there on it if you're interested in seeing how to make it work. Um, just super tremendous. I really do like it. And then the next one is my Open Sprinklers. Um, Open Sprinkler Project is another automation system. I could probably hook this up to Home Assistant. I just haven't done it yet. This is just so simple. I set it up. It just runs. I don't have to worry about it. It goes through my zones at a certain time of day, and it goes through 10 minutes and then takes an hour break and then does 10 more minutes because it's very hot here. It'll evaporate the water so fast that that gives it time to soak in and another chance to soak in again. But uh, this is how I water my yard. This is how I control it. It runs on a Raspberry Pi, and you just buy a, a controller board that you plug your Raspberry Pi into, and then you install Open Sprinkler. And I have a video out there on it that's pretty old, but as far as I know, the process has not changed. It is such a simple thing to really get set up and going. It just didn't take me much time at all to get it ready, and, and their support has been great. Um, anytime I've had a question or had an issue, they've really answered and tried to help me figure out what's going on. Um, so much so that I bought a second board, and I used two boards to actually handle all the zones in my yard. Um, and it's just been absolutely tremendous. So Open Sprinkler is a great project. Now I've shown you a lot of the UI stuff that I do. So I've, I've just got so much UI stuff. Even I'm not even showing you everything, but I've shown you a lot. Um, the other thing is the tools that I use and, and how I use them. So I showed you a video uh, last week, in fact, on one called NetDiscover. So if you do sudo netdiscover-r... And then we do 192.168.10.1 slash 24. NetDiscover is going to start running and it's going to start looking for anything on my network that falls into that range that I just gave it. Now I could give it a larger range, I could give it a smaller range, I could give it no range. And there's a way to look for disparate devices that aren't even on my subnet, but that are on my network. Um, which I have used because I had I'd received a webcam that basically was or not a webcam but an IP camera that had a set static IP that was nowhere near the address that I use on my network and it found it in like four seconds and it was great because then I could access that camera and change the IP address to be what I needed but it gives you a really great amount of information when you're looking for what's running on my network and I really really like this program it's a tremendous program um, it works really well. One that's very similar to it that I use all the time is called Angry IP Scanner. I've, I've shown that one as well in the past. Um, this is just an awesome program as well, and it'll do very similar things. So it kind of detects the range that you're sitting on when you start it. But you start it up, and it says, I'm going to go find all of your devices real quick. I'm going to give you the IP addresses. I'll give you the names of the devices. I'll give you what ports they have open. And you can say, I want to, you can set up second settings to set for, look for specific ports. You can set up settings for all kinds of stuff. 
But once it's finished, I mean, it goes really fast because it uses a bunch of threads to get it done. And you can see down here, the threads are kind of counting down and getting finished. Um, it's about to finish up and it'll give us a little message on the screen saying, hey, I'm, I'm done. I found everything I can find. Um, just an awesome, awesome tool. I use this thing all the time to find devices that have connected and potentially gotten a different IP address than I intended. And then you can sort by like this column to see the names of the things that it found with any kind of names. You can sort by the ports and you can see all the things that have this, the ports that you're looking for and you can kind of find it that way. I just such an amazing tool that just I, I use it all the time. Again, I have an, a video out there on this and in map as well. Um, super, super great tool. If you've never seen it, you definitely should go check it out. It's awesome. Um, other tools that I use, I think. Do I have Beamon? Yes. Yeah, so Beamon, I install this almost always. That's why I was pretty sure I had it. Uh, but here you, you get this tool and you can just kind of arrow down to see like which which devices are you really getting information from. And I'm going to zoom it back out just a little bit because I want you to see what it really looks like here. Um, this is this is Beamon. So you, you kind of arrow down to select whichever whichever thing you want you can see here's my wireless and what it's doing and you see the waveforms here in the terminal I don't even have to install a graphical user interface to see this so when you're running a headless server this is an amazing tool to install in your headless server and you can see what's going on with your bandwidth and you can monitor your bandwidth on that server to see if things look like they're working correctly from the interface that you expect which is great because if sometimes if you have multiple interfaces something may be going on you're kind of like what's happening here you want to go see what that is I can go down here and kind of check out the Docker Zero interface as well. It may not tell me a lot, but I can kind of see if there's anything going on. You can see there's a few packets going in and out. I can kind of see that, which is awesome. Um, so I can really monitor my different interfaces. So the WLAN is the one that's really doing a lot of work right now. And of course, ETH0 or the ENO1 in this case is also doing quite a bit of work. Um, so I have both of those things connected and doing things. So a uh, really, really tremendous tool is Beamon. Um, I believe I've got video out there on Beamon as well. Um, and then Enmon is another one that I love. Uh, this thing is just so great. It's such a simple interface. So if I want to see what's going on with my CPUs, I just type C and it's going to show me here's your CPU stuff and a nice little kind of terminal graphical interface, a TUI, I believe it's called. Um, and then if I want to see my uh, network, I could just type N or if I want to see my disk usage or memory, if I want to see memory usage, I type M network, I type N disk usage I type D and it just starts adding things and they kind of scroll down the screen so you may not see everything um, sometimes it's kind of hard to get to but really just a, another amazing tool to see what's going on with all of your different information uh, on your system and really kind of in a very nice compact way that you can get a good overview so another great tool to install on a server that you're running headless without a, a desktop interface um, so I amazing tools that I use all the time. These are tools that I use for doing my troubleshooting. These are tools that I use for figuring out like what's wrong with my system. What's going on with my system? How did I mess up my system? Um, the tools that are built in IP is, is a tool that's it's now in use in, in Linux. It's not my favorite. The layout is very not great in my opinion. Um, and especially because I tend to enlarge the, the font on my terminal because my eyes aren't great. Um, it doesn't lay out real pretty. Um, I loved IF config much better, but you can do that um, by doing sudo, and I'll, I'll make this bigger again. Uh, sudo apt, if you're doing apt, if you're using uh, uh, RPM based systems like Fedora, Red Hat, CentOS, and you would do DNF or RPM or YUM probably. If you're using um, OpenSUSE, you'd use Zipper if it's not already installed, but uh, install net hyphen tools dash Y. And we'll let that install real quick. Um, everything there looks okay. I think I should now be able to do IF config. Yes. For me, IF config just is a much cleaner interface. I don't know why they came up with IP. That thing, I guess it works good, but if they'd make it clean up and look like this, it'd be much better. Uh, but yeah, IF config just is so much easier to see. Like it's very clear, like this segmentation is, is easier to find things in. So I can find out what my well, my private IP is on any interface. It's very easy. I don't have to mess with looking around for stuff. There's that one that's statically set, so I'd expect it to be that. Um, just, just really great. So if you're looking for something like that, um, then definitely check out uh, NetTools. It's a very easy thing to install. It's just not installed by default on some OSs anymore for some weird reason. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, super, super great tool that I use quite a bit as well to figure out what's what's my network address, things like that. IPA show, and you can just type in like if you know what the network name is and you just see that one thing, which is fine. Uh, but for me, I just like to make sure that I've got um, something really simple and clean to look at. The other open source tools that I really use all the time are Docker. Docker Compose, Nginx, Proxy Manager, and those three together right there, and then Portainer, which I already talked about. Those four things right there can, can help you get into so many amazing open source applications that you want to self-host and run. You can run just about anything with those four pieces of software. And actually, Nginx Proxy Manager, once you've installed it, that's the only time you need to install it. If you're running everything on the same server, once you've installed Docker and Docker Compose, that's the one time you need to install it. Same thing for Pertainer. So once you've got those installed, you're really just working on top of those things. But man, they are such amazing, amazing open source tools. I know this has been a long video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you get something out of it. I hope that you've learned how I'm using the things that I teach you guys about every week, or at least that I try to teach you about every week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time.